Hello, everyone. Uh, let me go over uh, the test topics and then we can continue reviewing with some problems in preparation for tomorrow's test. Okay, so it's a couple of reminders. I have a health session coming up this afternoon. I had health sessions yesterday morning and afternoon, as well as this morning. Yesterday, I focused mainly on just solving differential equations. So um, if you weren't able to attend, but you want to see those problems worked out. Um, I work different problems between afternoon and the morning session. So those are available on the help session channel. And then also uh, this morning, I focused mainly on slow fields and also um, did more um, solving integral problems, integration method problems. And I also have another health session this afternoon. Um, maybe a similar session from this morning, but I'm also open to um, having anyone um, come in and ask questions. And um, if you want me to work through a specific problem, I can do that. Or going over a particular concept, I can do that. Uh, tomorrow morning, uh, health session 715. Um, either in person or um, through uh, Teams, but uh, I'll have that recorded as well. Uh, I'll be going over worksheet four, so I encourage you guys uh, to work through that worksheet. I think that'll be a good um, collection of, of problems that uh, uh, will be representative of what uh, you can expect on the test. So I encourage you guys to work through that, uh, but uh, you can also wait uh, for me to work through it uh, with you during the morning review, but um, preferably uh, if you were able to work through it this afternoon or tonight, um, you can kind of kind of get a sense as to um, how ready you are for tomorrow's test. And if you have any specific questions, then you can uh, feel free to reach out to me through Remind, or you can stop in during tomorrow's review session and ask your question there. Uh, I'm working on the key, so I should have the key updated later this afternoon, but the worksheet is, is available. Um, um, for you to um, uh, for you to access. Okay, so test tomorrow. I'll send out a remind this afternoon. Okay, so here are the topics to expect on the test: solving differential equations and find particular solutions. So separating variables, taking the antiderivative. If there's use substitution involved, to apply that. Uh, after we find the particular equation using the order pair. Okay. Uh, something separate but also related is can you write the equation of the tangent line? So taking order pair, taking slope, linear approximation using tangent line. So once you get that tangent line equation, just dump that decimal value into that tangent line equation. Uh, differential equation word problems. So we'll focus um, some time on this. We did this uh, um, two days ago, but we'll do another one of these. Basically, we're really not doing a whole lot of calculus here. We uh, we start with this differential equation, but we know it's going to end up with this general equation, and we just have to um, take our order pairs, put into um, solve for C, solve for K, and then uh, make a prediction as to a, either the time or specific value. But it could also go the other way, where I don't give you the initial uh, value, and you have to kind of work backwards, right? Solve for K. And they use the order pair to work backwards and solve for C. Okay. Uh, be able to uh, fill in slope field. If I gave you an empty slope field with uh, six to ten points uh, identified, then fill those in. So you can take your order pair, put it into the differential equation, get a number in return, and you're just going to translate that number, right? If it's a positive number, you're going to create a positive slope. If it's a negative number, you'll create a negative slope segment. If it's slope zero, you'll make a horizontal line. If it's slope undefined, you'll leave it blank. OK, no vertical line. You're just going to leave that space empty. Match slope field with appropriate differential equation. 
So what I mean by that is I'll give you, well, I think we did one um, yesterday or day before where I give you a completely filled out slow field and um, I have a couple of options and you have to match the option of the differential equation with the um, with the correct um, slope field. Uh, the rest are finding indefinite and indefinite integrals. So uh, going through the checklist, recognizing ones that involve natural logs or synthetic or long division, uh, use substitution is possible for those problems. Trig integrals, um, a lot of times it, it is use substitution for them, but Usually they're linear terms, so we, we talked about that shortcut, right, where we just take the derivative, we take the reciprocal, and we put that, we know that's going to be a leftover term that's going to be on the outside, and the rest is just matching the rules. Uh, exponential functions in the form of e to the u or a to the u, recognizing it, identifying the u value, and uh, matching the rule, and finding the antiderivative. And then the new ones uh, involving inverse trig, where we have to get the denominator to be showing parentheses squared so that we can pull the correct a and u value. But sometimes uh, the denominator is not quite set for us to pull the a and u value. And sometimes that requires us to uh, go from standard form to vertex form. And the way we do that is we go through completing the square to get that denominator um, uh, expression to be a little cleaner for us to pull the information that we want. So your test tomorrow, uh, eight to 10 questions, three pages. Okay. All right, any questions about the test? Okay, so today I'm gonna to pull problems from worksheet two and three, and also um, just miscellaneous problems uh, within these concepts here. So here's worksheet two. Worksheet two has domain on it, but we're not going to do domain, um, at least not for the test. Maybe I'll come back to it and revisit it when we do exam review. Uh, so that means we don't need uh, the slow field. Slow field is to help with the domain, um, but we'll just do particular solution, tangent line, and linear approximation. So. All right, so here's the differential equation. Order pair of um, y of negative three equals negative two. Okay, so before we can work in the order pair, we're gonna spend the time to cross multiply, separate the variables, take the antiderivative, and then we need that plus C to show up, right? Okay, so first things first, cross product. Cross product, um, a lot of times it may not guarantee uh, separation variables, but it will get your dy and dx in the right places. Okay, so that is, a, we're always gonna be able to accomplish that goal when you do cross product. Okay. The next thing is to look, do we have any variables that need to be moved? Do we have full separation of variables? Yes, we have full separation of variables, y is together, x is together. Uh, if there were any, any coefficients that was on the left side, I would go ahead and move it to the right because we wanna leave the left side as minimal, as bare as possible. Sometimes though, um, x's and y's may be out of place and they may end up being in the denominator. OK, so if they are in the denominator, just trust your algebraic skills, trust that's where they belong and just move forward because you know that there's a rule that can handle those X's and Y's in the denominator if that's where they end up. OK, but in this case, no denominator, so we can move forward as well. We do have full separation, so take the antiderivative. Okay, nothing complex here. Both are just power rules, so y becomes y squared over 2. 
Don't forget, plus C is going to show up. OK, next thing is uh, we have to eventually solve for C. We have to solve for Y, but I'm, I'm always looking at the left side to see even if there's a small thing that I can do to clean up. I'm going to take the time to do it. That's just my preference. So um, I see it divided by two here, and I can just take an additional step just to get that two moved over to the right side. Uh, the more um, little steps I can take on the left side, um, the cleaner my steps will be in the, at the end. So just kind of um, trying to split up all my my workload into um, smaller steps. So if I distribute the two through, denominator in both sides will go away. Now the two distributes to the C, but we know that two times C is just a constant, so we'll just let it just be a plus C. Uh, okay, we got to solve for Y, we got to solve for C, but um, anytime I see um, the, the chance of there being a square root, or even if this is a radical and I got to square both sides, um, if I see anything where this is going to be raised to either an exponent or a radical is going to is going to overtake this expression. I'm going to take the time to solve for C a little earlier um, before the complexity of um, that exponent shows up on the right side. So that's um, I'm looking at that to help guide my decision there. Now, if you do it, if you decide to solve for Y first and then solve for C, no problems there. It'll work out the same way. It's just uh, numerically, it's going to just be a little messier. OK, so I'm going to solve for C a little earlier. OK, negative 3 and for X, negative 2 and for Y. Okay, subtract uh, 9 from both sides. I guess C is equal to negative 5. Okay, once I have my C value, I'm going to replace uh, my C value where I initially made those replacements for X and Y. So don't just put it into any random C value that you see. It has to be with a specific equation that you that you decided to start your update. OK, now I can solve for Y. Now when the square root shows up, I know there's nothing else that, need, that I need to do on the right side. Um, so that's why I decided to save it to the end here. Okay, don't forget, plus or minus. Which tells us that we have two potential solutions, but only one is going to apply for our problem. So how do we know which one to choose? Oh, minus. Because? Because the y value gives us a negative. Good, so make sure that you're choosing specifically looking at the y value. The x value is not going to tell us what to choose. It's the y value. So if the y value is negative, that's going to tell you to choose a negative square root. Okay. If the y value is positive, then you'll choose the positive square root. OK, we're going to skip part B with the domain and we're going to go to C where we're going to find the tangent line equation. OK, so here's part C. Now the um, this problem only gave you the X value. Um, so if you want to find the Y value, you can just plug that negative root six directly into your 
equation and that will get you your y, to, uh, your y value. But I'm just going to, I'll give it to you on the test, but that's how you would find it. If they only gave you the x value, you use the specific equation to help you um, gain um, um, the other part of the order pair. So if I put negative root 6 in here, I get 6 minus 5 is 1, square root of 1 is 1, the negative outside makes it negative 1. Okay, but I'll give that to you on the test. I'll give you the full order pair. Okay, so what information do we need to find tangent line equation? Mr. A. Yes. I think I missed Use the y equals negative square root again. Oh, right. Okay, so why? Uh, how we got that negative square root? Uh, it's because the order pair shows a negative y value. So we're always going to be able to match our choice with the y value of the order pair. So if the y value is positive, then we want to choose a positive square root. If the y value is negative, then we know it's going to go with the negative square root. OK, that makes sense. Thank you. OK. All right, so part C, what information do we need to find tangent line equation? Point, slope. point and slope. All right, so we have the point. The point is, is right there for us. And how do we access the slope? Plug the point into the original derivative equation. Good. Derivative equation, right? Differential equation is your slope formula, is your derivative equation. Yep. So whatever they define the derivative to be, then you're just going to plug in and we're just going to um, access that value from there. OK, so. I have my order pair, I have my slope, and now I'm ready to put it into point slope form. Uh, resolve those negatives there, so I'll make it y plus 1. Okay, so there's my tangent line equation. All right, so we have our tangent line equation. How do we do linear approximation? Um, plug the, uh, negative 2.5 into the uh, particular slope and or the tangent line equation. Tangent line, yeah. Right, so I know that this um, throws students off linear approximation. Uh, it sounds complicated, but what we what we do is is basically in the name itself, right? If you look at the name, linear, right? Linear, that's a line, and the line is the equation that we just created, our tangent line. Approximation, so we're using the line to approximate a value, so whatever decimal we give it, we get, we just put it into that tangent line equation. So the direction of what we do is in the name itself. Okay. All right, so uh, I'm gonna solve for y first, get that negative one over to the other side. Now I can replace the x with negative 2.5 and then use the calculator to get my approximation. Okay, round to three decimal places. You can let that fourth value uh, round that third uh, decimal place up to four, or you can just drop it off at whatever they give you. Either is fine.
Okay, number two on uh, worksheet two is very much the same type of problem. Uh, solving differential equation, getting the particular solution, solving for C, solve for Y, tangent line equation, linear approximation. So I'll skip number two, but you're more than welcome to work on that um, as additional practice later. Okay, anybody still need this? They're pretty good. All right, let's go to number three, back page, or second page of uh, worksheet two. Okay, we're just going to do A and B. Uh, C, D, and E are um, more connected with previous units, and I'm just going to focus on what we need to do uh, for our test review. So, okay, so this is going to be a uh, solving or um, working with the exponential general equation and solving for C, solving for K. All right, so we have the rate of temperature decrease uh, for a cup of coffee. It's given by dy dt equals ky with t measured in minutes. Okay, we know this equation. It's just going to work itself down to y equals ce to the kt. So we know that's our general equation. So really, we're just skipping the calculus portion, jumping directly to the general equation, and we're just doing plug and chug with all these order pairs and finding, updating our general to a particular equation. But the way I like to organize it is uh, order pairs. I think order pairs are nicely structured. We can um, know where things plug in. So we know all these order pairs are going to be organized with time being the independent variable. And our dependent variable um, is, in is uh, referencing temperature. And I'll let T, uh, lowercase t represents time and Y represents temperature. All right, let's read the problem here or read the, um, the data given here. The initial temperature is 190 degrees Fahrenheit, and the temperature decreases to 76 degrees after five minutes. Okay, so what are some order pairs that we can create? Zero and 190. Yeah. So we always want to try to involve zero as part of your order pair. Zero is helpful. It's going to wipe out um, one variable for us and isolate the other one for us. So. Um, if it's a population problem and you're given us an uh, initial year, let's say it was 1930 uh, and then everything else is after 1930, then you're going to let 1930 be t equals zero and uh, make and uh, adjust the rest of the years based off of zero. So always involve zero um, as one of your order pair. Okay, what about temperature decreasing to 76 degrees after five minutes? So five. Yeah, we want to let five come first because five is our independent variable, so that's going to go in for T in minutes, and then 76 degrees. Okay, skipping down here. Um, how long will it take for the temperature to decrease to 50 degrees? So we're looking for time. So we'll let T be the missing variable. And 50, we want to find, predict how long it will take for the temperature to drop to that, that um, degree measurement, that temperature. So generally, this is how we go about it. Um, we solve for C using the original order pair. We can update the equation, and from there, we can uh, solve for K, update the equation, and finally, we can solve for the missing variable. In this case, the missing variable is T. All right, so spend a few minutes, see if we can make some progress, and we'll check our work.
All right, so let's see how far we got. First things first, I'm going to involve that order pair 0, 190, 0, in for t, 190, in for y. And just like what we suspected, that 0 is helpful. It's going to wipe out that k for us. We can solve for c first. Our c is 190. Update our equation. And once we updated our equation with the updated c value, we can make progress. Take the second order pair. And that second order pair can help us solve for K. So 5 goes in for T, 76 goes in for Y. We get 76 equals 190 E to the 5K. I eventually want to get to that K variable, but that K is sitting in the exponent. But first things first, I want to just isolate that E, that exponential um, expression e to the 5k first, so just divide both sides by 190. Okay, so when we do that, um, we can use our calculator to reduce it down to a fraction, um, but sometimes a decimal can be a little cleaner to plug into the calculator. Don't have to deal with as many complex fractions, so I just leave it as 0.4. Cleans up nicely, but we still have to bring that exponent k down. So if we involve natural log, we know natural log has a nice way of bringing, allowing that exponent to freely come down. And then we have a much easier time working with a variable uh, that is not sitting up in the exponent. So when that 5k comes down, we get 5k times natural log of e. We know natural log of e just goes away to one and now we have now we get a much easier time solving for k. So divide both sides by five. And we want to leave our k value as an exact value, no decimals. OK. Now that we have, okay, so uh, no decimals because we're, we're saving that approximation for the end. Okay. If we have a decimal come out too early, uh, that's going to decrease our uh, accuracy for the, our end product. So we'll leave our K value as an exact value. Update our equation. Now we have our particular equation that we can use to um, make predictions for other values or other um, either solving for other t values or solving for other y values. In this case, if we're solving for t given a specific uh, temperature. So 50 goes in for y, and then we can solve for t. Replace 50 in for y, and then I see I eventually have to get to that exponent t, but first I'm going to move that 190 over, so divide both sides by 190. I get 5 over 19. Now involve natural log to bring that exponent t along with the coefficient down in front. Once that exponent comes down, natural log of e can just drop away. And we can divide both sides by that messy coefficient, but um, we we'll just make the calculator do the work for us. This is what I have in the calculator. All right, any questions? OK, I'll leave this up a little longer if you want to.
All right, no questions. All right, let's uh, I'll pick a problem for us to do uh, involving integration method. So I'm pulling a problem that's not on the worksheet. I'm just creating one here. So if you guys can copy this down. All right, if we go down our checklist here, uh, we see the denominator is giving us trouble for our first option. Too many terms, we're not able to separate into individual fractions. That denominator is not easily movable. So first option is out. Uh, second option is use substitution. But if we let the U value be the denominator, we see the numerator degree is not favorable for that situation, right? If we have numerator and denominator, usually, um, we want the denominator to be degree higher, but only by one degree. The gap between those degrees of numerator and denominator is a little too much uh, for use substitution to handle nicely. So we know that option is out. Third option, synthetic long division. Usually we save that for when the numerator is the same degree as the denominator, or the numerator has a higher degree than the denominator, but we don't see that in this case. So our last option is arc trig. And arc trig is potentially a good option here because the denominator is greater than the numerator and there is a sizable gap between those degrees. So um, notice the degree in the denominator is, is two, degree in the numerator is zero. So whenever we have that difference of two or more with the denominator being the higher of the two, then uh, we know that potentially is a, is a good fit for a potential arc trig. So we want the denominator to be higher than the numerator in terms of the exponent degree by two or more de by two or more degrees. All right, so between the three arc trig, which is going to be the best fit? Um, would be arc tan. Arc tan, yeah. yeah, because no square root, right? No square root, we know we're uh, the only option left is must be arc tan. I'll put the arc tangent rule next to it so we can just have uh, easy access to it. It'll be on your formula sheet as well. All right, so. We know that we're targeting our tangent. We know that eventually we need to have two sets of parentheses showing up so that we can pull the A and U value uh, appropriately. But the denominator is not quite ready for that. Okay, We have standard form, which is not quite that uh, method, uh, suitable form that we want to be able to pull the U value, especially the U value. So we want to get into vertex form. But to get to vertex form, what can we involve here to get that? To show up. Yeah, complete the square allows that denominator to, to be in a better um, form for us to work with. So we'll complete the square here. So when we complete the square, we keep all the terms that we see in front of us. All the signs will, will stay the same. We're just going to insert a space to the left and to the right of the 27. Okay. Now make sure that for your spaces, one is positive and the other is negative. In fact, the first one is positive and the second one is negative. Okay. Make sure there's that sign difference because we want the overall value to cancel out. Now, what uh, what formula goes into, uh, what formula do we use to get that uh, blank space filled in? Uh, 
Uh -huh. Okay, our B value is negative 10. And first space, 25. Second place, space, also 25, but there's negative in front. So this should factor nicely. Multiplies to be 25, adds it to be negative 10. What value here? Mm -hmm, negative 5. There we have binomial squared, so we know that is something that we need for our denominator for our arc trig rule. Twenty-seven minus twenty-five. That's just going to give us plus two. Okay. Let me reset. And I'm going to rewrite my denominator. But essentially, I have not changed my overall uh, value, but I have put it into a form that is easier to work with. So these are equivalent, but this is just more helpful for us. However, uh, we want two sets of parentheses to show up so that we can pull the A and U value correctly. We're not quite ready to get that um, A value, so. We want to represent the denominator in this form without changing the overall value. Well, it looks like the X minus five is ready to go, right? That's already in the form that we need. But now we need this to show up so that we can pull the A value. What can we put inside the parentheses so that when I square it, I get two? Root two. Root two. Okay. Notice I have not changed anything about the denominator in terms of the overall value, but I have made it visually more helpful for us to pull the A and U value. Okay, your A value is always the constant. Your U value always has the variable in it. Sometimes you may have your A and U value flip flop, and that's okay because these are both positive. But for arc sine and arc secant, that's very specific, right? Arc sine, the A has to come first, uh, arc secant, the U has to come first because the order, the, the sign difference um, is there. Here, there's no sign difference, so just be aware that, um, you know, they may be flip flop, but as long as you know what the A and U value is, it's okay. Okay, we're going to identify my A and U value here. So A is root 2, my U is X minus 5. Find the derivative du dx is equal to 1, dx equals du. So I'm going to I'll get everything in terms of a and u uh, so that I can convince myself that I'm ready to apply my rule. And I'm also going to keep track of any coefficients that's um, part of my process there. I'm going to pull the negative 3 out in front. All right, so it looks like I'm ready, right? That negative three, I pulled the negative three out. Uh, that's part of our answer, but I just want to, if we look, right, our, we have perfect match. I, I got my A and U flip flop, but that's okay. So now we can jump into our rule. But I'm going to start with the negative three first so I don't lose track of it. So I'll have the negative three coming in front, followed by the one over A. My A value is root two. Our tangent of u over a, my u is x minus 5, my a is for 2. Plus c. It's OK to have radicals in the denominator. No need to rationalize the denominator.
Okay, any questions here? Did the root two come from in the denominator? Right, where did that right, where did that root two come from? So you're good with this part, right? With this x minus five squared plus two? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So but the rule that we want to use is a squared plus u squared. Right. And if we if we let the if we think the a value is two, then it's not really filling that form correctly. So to help us see the correct a value. We're going to purposely put a parenthesis squared, give us that restriction there, and fill the parentheses with a number without changing the overall value. Okay, okay thank, thank you. you. Yeah, because we have to get that form to show up, and that goes for all the R trig rules. All the R trig rules has A squared and U squared involved, so we always want to take this additional step, get the parentheses to show up, get the squared there, and that way. Uh, we have that structure um, to allow us to find the correct a and u value. Otherwise, if we don't do that, then we may end up pulling the wrong a value. Okay, good. Any questions? Any other questions? All right, I want to uh, spend the remaining time just doing some uh, slope field problems. So this is off of uh, the practice uh, worksheets that we did, we spent time going over one through four, um, gathering general characteristics and being able to match the appropriate ones. So, uh, okay. actually, let's just do one of them. This is number eight. Okay. If you don't have it, that's okay. Just kind of follow along. But I'll rewrite the. Um, the answer choices to make it easier to read. OK, so we like to start off by just uh, listing out um, properties that we can gather about the slope field because um, we have a restriction in terms of we don't know exactly what these slope values are. I mean, we know that this is a really steep positive slope. We know this is a gradual, um, more gradual positive slope. But we don't know the exact value, but we, what we can tell we can identify what um, collection of slope zeros, collection of slope undefined, collection of slope positive slopes, as well as negative slope. So I'm going to list them out and see if we can make some observations. All right, so let's start with slope zero. Um, do you see a collection of slope zero and where are they located? Uh, x equal to one. Yeah, all along this uh, vertical line, right? Anywhere that x is equal to one, we're guaranteed that we're getting a slope zero, okay? All right, do we see a collection of slope undefined? Maybe along the axis, but especially along the, the y, uh, x axis, right? But just be aware that a lot of times x and y axis is not giving us a clear picture. So if that's the case, we'll just put a question mark and move forward. We may have to rely on other properties and not on that. Um, um, we don't see a we don't see a, a gap that is easy to identify. All right, what positive slopes? Can you make some general observations as to where we see positive slopes? Yeah, so looks like all these are, for the most part, right? All these are, for the most part, positive slopes, obviously with the exception of um, what we identify to be slope zero. But we can make that observation, right? So when y is greater than zero, 
we should be getting all positive slopes. Um, I've had some of those students say quadrant one and quadrant um, two. That's fine as well. Right, but this is probably more um, helpful uh, when we're trying to plug in and, and identify. Okay, where do you see negative slopes? Yeah, so when y is negative, right? When y is negative, we see. So it looks like y is completely dictating the positive and negative slopes. So that's something um, to observe there. Some people say quadrant three, quadrant four, that's fine as well. So when you list these properties, um, I think the fastest way is try to find the wrong choices, right? If you can find the wrong choices, you can eliminate them and hopefully it'll, you can eliminate all the wrong choices. Hopefully that'll get you down to the right answer. And if it doesn't, it'll at least narrow it down to hopefully just two choices. And then you can look at, you know, look at it more in detail and difference between the two uh, um, differential equations and use uh, maybe specific order pairs to help you narrow down the wrong one or, or narrow down to the right one. OK, so which one can we eliminate from the first option here? That means when I plug one in for X, I must get a slope zero. Which one is not fulfilling that condition? OK, so let's try. Let's see what happens with B, right? If I put one in for X, I get Y over zero and Y over zero is not the same thing as slope zero. And immediately, as soon as we see something that conflicts with, with the property that we identify to be true, we can just go ahead and eliminate it, right? And these the same way, we see x minus 1 in the denominator. If I put 1 in for x, I get negative y over 0. And negative y over 0 is not the same thing as slope 0, right? Slope 0 is more like 0 in the numerator and either something in the denominator or right, 0 over a non-zero or a potential non-zero. And we see that's not the case. Okay, so that's good, right? We narrowed it all the way down to just A and C. And we know that positive slope is dependent on when Y is greater than zero. We know negative slope is dependent on when Y is less than zero. So can you tell which one? It'll be A, It'll be A. okay. Good, so this is telling us that this numerator has no say as to the sign of the fraction, right? The sign of the fraction is completely dependent on that Y value. So when Y is positive, it's completely driving that decision as to when this fraction is positive. So when Y is positive, this is guaranteed to be positive. When Y is negative, this fraction is guaranteed to be negative, and we have those properties there. This one is not correct because Y is squared, so Y is not, and this equation is not driving that decision of whether it's positive or negative slope. All right, so those are the decisions that, you know, comparisons that you're looking to do um, as you're deciding between. But I think this is a nice structured way of listing out uh, properties, then eliminating the wrong ones, and then if you're down to two, hopefully um, uh, you're able to. Now, if you're still struggling with uh, deciding which one is the correct one, then maybe target some order pairs, right? Maybe you can plug in, test, you know, you know that if I plug 6, 6 in, I must get a, a rather large positive number. And if that doesn't work, then, you know, start picking different order pairs. And But hopefully, if you're having to test order pairs, you're having to just do between two choices, right? Um, we should be able to eliminate a lot of the wrong choices just by looking at some general properties. All right, so... Uh, Test tomorrow, help session this afternoon, morning review tomorrow. Encourage you guys to do worksheet four. I think that will be a good um, indicator as to how comfortable you, you feel about the topics for the test. Uh, again, I don't have the, the key ready yet, but I should have it within the next hour or two and I'll upload it. And if it's uploaded, it'll be the link will be active. OK. Um, all right, study for your test. You can reach out to me through Remind if you have any questions, but otherwise, hopefully I'll see you afternoon session or morning session if you need it. All right, thanks everyone. Hope you guys have a great day. Uh, Mr. Uh,
Ching? Yes. Uh, I have a question. Sure. About one of the homework problems. Yeah. What's um, that? It's number three of the inverse trig antiderivatives. And I just got a different answer from the calc chat, so I was confused. I could read it to you if you want. Yeah, I can also pull it up too. Okay. Which um which problem is it? Um number three of five point seven inverse trig antiderivatives. Yeah, did you use uh did you use arc sine? No, no, I used, uh, used the arc secant, right? Yeah. And yeah, I just is, have one okay. half in front of it, but the calc chat mm -hmm. just didn't have like anything in any Yeah, this one's a little more difficult. And the reason why is because um we need to force that that, that denominator to be a little um a little more helpful or to, to mm -hmm. match the rule. So here's what the rule says. Um, du over u squared square root of u squared minus a squared, right? That's the rule that you're trying to target. Yeah. Okay. Now the denominator is mostly ready, but that x is presenting a little bit of a problem. Okay, so you fill this in with 2, right? Mm hmm. Okay, so well, I put it 2x. Good. And the second one you filled in with? One. Okay. Would Good you have two. to multiply the like uh, numerator what? by two to make the x a two? Let's see, right? Let's see what happens. Uh, our u value is 2x. Our a value is one. du dx is two. dx equals du over two, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is what we have. I can replace this with u, that's ready to go. I can replace the one with a, that's ready to go. I get du over two, which it feels like an extra thing, right? Mm -hmm. But you see how I need a, a u, sorry, that's not a u square, that's a u here. Okay, have a great day, guys. Bye, have a good day. You see how I need a u out in front? Mm -hmm. And the u is a 2x. Yeah. So I'm going to put that 2 along with the x in front. And so this fits nicely here. That is mm -hmm. my u value right there. Okay. So there's not going to be a leftover 2 because that 2 is going to be part of the u that I need in front. Um, I have like one more question. I can ask it later in the help session if you want, but on number 35, there's a 2x in the numerator. And I like I did the completing the square and everything, but I didn't know what to do with that, how to get that to go away. Because when I I did, I completed the square and then I got x plus three squared and then um, a value is two. Mm -hmm. But when I take the deriv derivative of the x plus three, it's just one. So there's it's just times du. There's nothing canceling out the two x. So I wasn't sure what to do. Yeah, this one is more difficult. Uh, this one you have to go through u substitution first. And then the numerator is going to be left with a coefficient or a, a, a constant. And then you got to separate. So you won't see one. Sorry, you won't see one as messy as this on the on the test, so we can make it a little bit more difficult. All right, thank you. OK, all right, have a great day. You too. Okay, bye.